Thank you so much for joining us here on The Dwelling Show today. Uh, I'm your host, Ola Dantes. I could not wait to, you know, get talking with you here today, Tom. How are you doing, Ola? Doing great. Yeah, I'm good to, good to see you again. Obviously, I was on your podcast um, a few weeks back, and it's just, I'm really excited to have you on The Dwelling Show. So let's, let's, let's jump right into it. Tom, you, I've read so much about you. You're doing a lot of awesome things, yeah, you know, with the Good Success brand, with your own companies. Um, so I'm sure you can do a way better job than I can. Can you just tell our dual listeners a little bit more about you and kind of what you've been up to lately, actually? Well, sure. Thanks you so much for having me on the podcast. I love being able to connect and share and care as much as I possibly can. Um, I kind of... You know, to kind of back out a little bit, I kind of feel like God's put me on this earth for two reasons. Um, and it's normally, number one, to glorify him, but to add value to my communities. And I do that through real estate and I do that in many different other ways that we do that with good success and encouraging and challenging people. Uh, you know, I mean, that's really what the good success brand's about. It's not really about to make money. It's not really about to um, do anything for itself. It's really about how do I encourage other people to do use whatever it is that they've been given, whether it's time, talent, treasure, a real estate career, whatever the case is to be able to help others and to be able to, um, you know, be that conduit and, and not a bucket. So for me, like uh, our companies, we have like seven or eight different companies, but really a uh, kind of the core focus would be two different core focuses. Number one, um, Olson group network. We, um, build and steward, uh, single family, mostly single family, some multifamily, but, but some sing, mostly single family uh, portfolios for investors. So we actually build rental portfolios for investors and then we steward or manage, you know, property manage them down the road um, and try to stay in contact with them and be their, be their customer service, be their liaison for, you know, to how to, you know, continue having cash flow and actually help them build a legacy financially and also pass it on to their other generations. And um, so that's, that, that, that's what the Olson Group Network does. I have a, I have a buy and sell company or um, a development company, you could, we could call it. I have a construction management company and then a property management company that manages on the back end. And then Good Success, we really kind of have three core products, I guess you could call it. One is a Good Success podcast, which you were just on it. Um, and that's where we, we just really sit down like, like we're sitting down right now and try to learn from other people and learn what their best practices are. Um, maybe try to promote them and see if we can help their, them in their business at all, but also kind of get out of them what good success is. And um, to them, you know, by knowing who we are, but then also try to like get out of them, you know, a really good tip from them or something that can really help people along their way. Um, the community go giver event is coming up in June and that's a good success product as well. And that is really, it tells everybody about us. It tells them our story, how we manage properties, how we build rental portfolios. Um, and at the same time, giving people education on how to fix and flip, how to do turnkey rentals and active turnkey, but also giving people an opportunity to either um, go along with me in my quest to flip the entire city of Gary, Indiana. And we kind of talk about how, how we're doing that and kind of, you know, where we're at in that 80 year uh, trek that I feel like I'm in right now. I'm, I'm 40 years old. I plan on living to being 120. So that means I got, you know, 80 more years. Right. So uh, that, so that the, the community go giver event is kind of more about us and, us teaching and us having, it's kind of like a conference for three days and we have two days of bus tours, great group of network. And then the premier uh, uh, product that we have or whatever you want to call it is the mastermind for elite real estate entrepreneurs or an elite Christian businessmen that really want to collaborate. I mean, it, this is the problem and, and, and I'm sure that, that you've run into this. You know, you go to your local RIA and you learn how to do some stuff or you go to some boot camps for some people and you get or you get a bunch of education and you get a coach and you start to do these things and you're the person that actually is doing. And before too long, I mean, really a, a year or two into your real estate career, you're the expert in the area. So now, now it's like you go to the RIA and you kind of feel like there's no sense. Like it doesn't really help me anymore. Um, and, and it's, and if it does help you, it does help you in, in the, in the term of like, you can educate, you can have influence, you can do all that, but you don't then have a place to go to and talk to somebody that you can actually have a conversation on the level that you want to have it on. Um, and you don't have anybody to go and ask questions to on what's the next step. How do I get through this problem? Because nobody else in that area is having your problem. 
Um, so that's really what the mastermind is. Is I mean, that's one of the main problems that the mastermind solves. The other problem, I, for me at least, it, it, and that is what separates our mastermind from any other mastermind, is the fact that I try to push everything back to, um, honestly, Christian principles and what, what's the right thing to do. Um, it's not just about what does business say I do, which is all about profit, 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 profit. It's profit is there, but if you don't have charity, what, what does it profit you? You know, people think people have this, this mixed up. They think it with no profit, there's no charity. That's not true. Without no charity, there's no profit. And, um, and, and that's, I always pull people back. You know, I try to pull the curtain back a little bit and make sure that that is part of the conversation. And the other thing is, is what's your purpose here on earth? I don't hear this being talked about at, at masterminds. It's all about what are your problems? How can we help you fix your problems? But at the end of the day, sometimes the way you should fix a problem or the direction that everybody ought to have a life's purpose, they ought to, they ought to live life on purpose, for purpose, and then people have seasons of life. And sometimes, you know, your my season right now of life, I have kids. So, so I have to make sure that that is the part of the purpose and the daily things that I do on purpose to be able to provide for my kids, but also be able to give them training, to be able to give them admonition, to be able to give them exhortation, to be able to give them discipline if I need to, to be able to give them um, the tools that they need, and which for me is partly leave, of leave, that's the legacy I leave. Um, so that, that's the other problem that I feel like our mastermind solves that maybe some others don't, that we really focus on the, why you do what you do and making sure that, that you do the right thing. And then, um, the accountability piece, any, any good mastermind is going to have a lot of accountability, um, and having monthly phone calls where we're like, Hey, what are you doing with that? We have a guy last quarter, he lost 66 pounds in 90 days. Now he had a lot to lose. But uh, it was, it, you know, he, 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 he held himself accountable to that. And it was, it was amazing to see. And now the group's kind of starting to kind of work together on that as well. Um, and, that's, and that's just an example of the accountability piece there. And then the, the, the third problem I would say that it solves is, is just deal making. There's a lot of deals, obviously, in the mastermind of people, of like-minded people that you feel like now you know their story, you're willing to trust them now with your money or with, you know, with your name on, on, on a deal or whatever. So um, that's kind of like um, me, and I'm not sure if that's what you wanted or not, but that's kind of like what, what I'm really fact, uh, focused on and what I'm really passionate about is helping people that create their purpose to know what their roles and responsibilities are to encourage as many people as they possibly can encourage. You know, there's too much talk about everything that's wrong in this world. There really is. There's way too much chatter. You look, you look at your Facebook page or you look at Twitter or you look, it's all that it is is a bunch of people complaining about a bunch of people complaining. And I'm trying to help turn that tide. I don't believe in that. I just think we, it's a bunch of waste of time. And I think at the end of the day, if we'd focus our time on things that are positive and create a snowball effect in that direction of encouragement and exhortation and challenging people to do more and to do better and to get better every day, um, I think this whole world would be a better place. So in many respects, I believe that I am changing the world, but I have to change myself first. I have to manage myself first, and then I can help lead other people into a, uh, a way of, of having what we believe is good success. Wow. Thank you so much. That, that is giving me so much, um, you know, to go by. That's a fantastic, um, you know, foundation for, for, for our interview here. So first things first, I, I love what you guys are doing with good success. Um, you know, really narrowing your focus down on Christian principles and everything we need essentially to live a really good life. It's there in the Bible. So I'm, I'm with that. Yeah. So I really like that. That is so unique, so different, so needed. Um, you know, in the world in our time now. Before I go to that, though, I want to kind of go all the way back historically. Why real estate? What got you started in real estate? Um, I boy, this is this is a long story too. So you may not have time for all this today. So you you know, our podcasts are like 45, 50 minutes, and uh, most podcasts are like 10, 20, 30 minutes. So hopefully, you have time for this. Um, real estate. So I read the book uh, Think and Grow Rich when I was twelve years old. Um, and that's kind of what the, that's what the mastermind centered on. I, and I read another book. I think it was the first year it came out when I was 19 or 20 years old. I read, um, rich dad, poor dad. And, um, I never really thought about real estate, you know, in high school, I don't think most kids think about that kind of stuff, but I was in construction. I literally started working in construction when I was 12 years old. I went up to my eighth grade history teacher and I'm like, Hey, 
do you have any work for me? And that's where like where I got started in real estate, but was in the construction because every real estate needs construction, just so you guys know. Construction is a very valid piece and a very needed, you know, it's probably right now it's probably one of the hardest pieces to make happen in real estate is the construction piece. Um, but I, that's where I started. I got my start in construction and all through junior high, all through high school, I worked a full-time job all through the summer, 60 plus hours a week during the summer. I'm not even sure that they're allowed to do that now with the labor laws, uh, you know, for 13 and 14 year olds. But I mean, I worked my tail off. I went to a Christian private school in which my parents couldn't afford to send me there after I think it was eighth or ninth grade. So I, de I decided I was going to pay my own way because I really wanted to stay there. Um, so, and then I can still remember in high school going to basketball practice, being done at five or six o'clock at night and then going and working until midnight just just so I could um, continue to, to, to have that job and work as much as I possibly could for that. Um, so in, I started construction. I um, got married super young. Um, I was 20 years old when I got married. And my, um, I, my, me and my brother-in-law bought our first rental together when I was 21 years old. So that's kind of really how I got started. In, in after, I, after I read the book, I'm like, man, we should really should get started. You know, that one house kind of like went good and bad. And at the end, we decided to end up just selling it, you know, three or four years later, it made, I don't know, 30 or 40 grand in the deal. It wasn't a bad deal, but it really wasn't the best deal. And, um, and my real start though came many, many years later. So I started a side business in construction when I was like, again, like right out of high school. Um, and I would work a lot of time in construction at night after my jobs all through my 20s. And um, 2006 happens, right? So 2006 happens. And, and most people think it's 2008 where everything happened in real estate, right? But you're laughing because you, maybe you know or maybe you don't. But 2006 is when new construction really completely like fell apart. And that was where I, that was where I lived. I lived in new construction. So um, 2006 happens. And I go from, you know, doing a lot of work, making, you know, with my full-time income plus my side jobs, I was making well over six figures. Um, in 2006 and almost overnight it shut down. So I go from making six figures to like 20 grand a, a year overnight. And I'm like, what the crap am I going to do? You know, like this is not cool. So I, um, I, I started making some phone calls. Like that's what you do, right? When you don't have work, do you just sit on your butt and just go collect welfare? Do you just do like, no, like you get your freaking butt up, you make some phone calls and say, Hey, what can I do for you? How can I add value to you? Um, the first question, the first thing is ask, you know, just ask the questions, who, who, who can I help? So I just started calling people. I got to the third person I called and the guy's like, yeah, I got a job for you. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I went and met him the next day and it was a painting job. And um, so I, I, I gave him a bid, you know, that day. Uh, he said, okay, when can you start? I'm like, I can start tomorrow. And uh, I did that job. I told me it was going to take 10 days. This was how much money it was going to, it was going to cost. And um, a funny thing happened. I got done on time and on budget. And, um, you know, for me, I had never heard this from a, because most of my customers on the side were not, you know, developers or not contractors. Um, they were homeowners. Now, when I was working for my boss, most of his people that we were working with were, were um, you know, contractor. So he had maybe these conversations, but I had never had this conversation because, you know, to a homeowner, you go out and give them a price and it's like, you know, four or $5,000. They don't really say this to you, but this guy, he, he, he told me, he's like, you are the first person that's ever gotten done on time and on budget ever. In, in, in the whole time I've ever been doing business, like you are the first person to ever get done with any job I've ever given them on time and on budget. And I was like, Oh my goodness, I guess that's a pretty big deal. Right. Um, so, and I'm thinking to myself, well, doesn't everybody just do that? Like, don't, doesn't everybody just do what they say they're going to do? And, and I can tell you with buying and selling 1,600 houses like we have and now managing, you know, going from zero to 180 uh, doors under management in the last 18 months, people don't normally do what they say they're going to do. Um, and, you know, so I didn't realize how much of a shock it was back then. And I didn't realize it was, it should have been a shock, but, but it was apparently. So that guy, he's like, you know what? I want you to hire, I want, I'm going to hire you full time and you are going to manage all my rehabs. At the time, what the guy was doing is he was working for a wholesaler and the wholesaler company, he was wholesaling investors' houses and then he's like, I have this construction company over here and I'm gonna sell you the construction as well. Um, so the, everybody was like, okay, cool. So, that, I mean, so 
we kind of had a great in with, with buyers because they knew that they had the construction piece kind of taken care of as well. So one thing led to another and we start, I started managing three rehabs a month. So we were basically doing about, we were completing two to three rehabs every single month. And with that went along for about six months. And by then I'm starting to get a little smarter here. Um, either that or I was getting a little cocky. I'm not sure one or the other, but, um, I, I, I somehow weaseled my way in. I'm maybe weaseled, not the right word. I don't know, but I, I, I worked really hard. I'll tell you, I was working 60, 80 hours a week doing this. And um, I became partners with a guy. So I was a 50, 50 partner with a guy in because he didn't want anything to do with it. By, the, by this time I was managing the owners. I was managing getting utilities turned on. I was managing everything. Like even to the inspection response with, with, you know, the, when, when somebody came to buy the property and, uh, and, so I became 50, 50 partners with the guy. And then about a year later, so that everything kept going fine. Like I said, we were doing about two or three rehabs a month. We worked, I worked with this guy for about 18 months and then he decides he's going to up and move to Alabama. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. I just went through this. Didn't I? I mean, you know, two years ago I went from great job to like nothing. And, um, so I just like set up at late one night and I was praying and I'm like, what do I do? And this thought came into my head. Well, you already have, you already have everything that you need. You have the, you have the ability to find investors. You know how to find them houses now, because now I was in the whole process of actually giving an estimate to somebody before they even bought the house. And I was already in these conversations of this is how much money I'm going to make if I buy it for this much money. And this is how much um, I need to, to, to uh, pay for repairs. Um, and so like, I'm learning all this. You know, I learned the job. I learned this more job than probably anybody you'll ever meet. You know, going through 15, 20 years of, and I should say 15, probably 10 to 15 years of really learning construction and then going through five years of really learn, working with investors before I ever even wholesale a house. You know, one time um, I had done 130 rehabs for investors that were, were buying from a wholesaler to then go and flip. And honestly, the guys made an average of probably like twenty nine, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on every one of those houses. So they, I did really well for those guys. Didn't realize the value that I was, I was bringing them. Um, and, uh, so I, so I went to those guys, you know, I went to those guys and I was like, Hey, if I can help you find a house, so instead of you buying from a wholesaler, I'm going to help you go to the MLS and I'm going to help you find houses and we can do this. And I'll, and I'll go out, I'll look at the houses for you. While I look at the houses, I'll start creating my proposals and I'll say, this isn't a good deal for you. Um, so basically I was a wholesaler and I wasn't even getting paid to be a wholesaler. I was a bird dogger and I wasn't even getting paid to bird dog. Um, and, and I told him if I, if I can help you find a house and I can give you the price to do it and I can actually get the work done for you. I'll help you get utilities turned on and then I'll help you sell it at the back end because I know the best realtor in town and she can make sure that she gets her, uh, sold. Um, would, would you buy and, and would you do this? And all I want out of this whole deal is I want to get to do the construction. It's a pretty good deal, right? Like if you could find a contractor right now that would say that to you, you'd be an absolute moron to say no. Um, so, so that's what I did. And, you know, like I said, after working with those guys, we did like 130 houses for the, so that's what I did. And that's one thing kind of led to another, um, about two or three years later, me and a partner hooked up and we started, um, wholesaling houses. And like I said, we, we wholesaled probably 12 or 1300 houses between 2009, I think it was, and, uh, 2015. And the one year we did like 300 houses in one year that we wholesaled. Um, and then during that, during that time period, I actually created a program called the Active Turnkey Program, which basically was the exact same thing that I was doing for these investors before, except for they were flipping. And I was now, the Active Turnkey Program was selling to, um, you know, buy and hold uh, you know, investors. So basically the active turnkey program is I wholesale you a house, my construction company rehabs a house, and then my property management company manages the house for you. And at the all in, you know, you're into these houses like 80% of after repair to appraised value. So now you can pull out, you know, 25, you know, you basically pull everything out, but you know, like 25, 30% of after repaired appraised value. So maybe now instead of buying a turnkey house where you're into it 20 or 25, now you're only into the house like maybe eight or 10 or 15. It helps you recycle your money and have less money into the deal all in all. Um, so I always thought it was a really good deal for the investor. and It was a good deal for us. Um, so I, 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 so that's kind of what we developed um, over the years was, a, and I actually even have a, a book called Active Turnkey. It is on amazon.com. And um, if you, if you want a copy of it, you can always just email me as well. And I could send you a copy that way as well. So, um, 
So that's kind of where we got to where we are right now. Um, you know, started the Good Success Company three or four years ago. And um, right now we have about uh, 30 members. We'll probably have 40 people at the next mastermind in May. And I'm trying to teach other people to kind of do somewhat what we're doing. But I'm, I'm not really focused on the mastermind as much as teaching people how to do, but how to make sure we refocus on how to do the right things. Wow, that is a lot as well. Oh my god. I told god. you. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that. There's there's so many good things in there. I want to just kind of just touch on one thing you mentioned. So you were basically adding value, right? That's kind of what your success has been, you know, based upon. You're going to people and saying, hey, I can do this for you. And if I do X for you, um, can you let me do Y, you know, basically for my business? And I think that that you know, formula really does work, right? You're definitely, you're consistently adding value to others. Now, if there's somebody listening to our podcast here and they're thinking, well, I want to go into flipping, right? I want to, you know, maybe start doing these flips myself, but I'm not sure. Um, or maybe I can just look for someone like Tom to help me do this. What would you say to that person that is just, you know, right, just starting their career in real estate and they want to make some money? What would you say to that person? I will tell you that your network is your net worth when you're talking about starting out. It's not about the knowledge that you know starting out because everything you think you know, you don't. Um, <laughs> it's about who's going to do it with you. So I highly recommend when people are starting out, do their first deal with somebody else. Like just go through the whole process with somebody. Even if you don't make any money or even if you are only kind of a fly on the wall or even if you can be the investor um, and, and put your cash into it and let somebody else do all the work and they're willing to maybe split the profits with you to help, you know, you learn that. I'm just, I'm so, I'm so far against just jumping in and figuring it out when it comes to fix and flipping. Now, when it comes to rentals, I'm the opposite. Because I think if you're owning a rental as an investment, there's a lot of things over time that will fix a mistake up front. I say if it's rentals, just kind of start it one at a time and, um, but you know, Michael Zuber, one of a great friend of mine has the book, you know, a one rental at a time, you know, follow a roadmap like that, where you can just do it. Or if you're a, if you're an, if you make a lot of money and you're on the other side, I really highly recommend going with like some kind of a really good trusted advisor, like a turnkey provider or something like that, that can get you there. And you don't have to mess with all of the details. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of different avatars that I just talked about there though. But if you're, a, if you want to get into fix and flip, that's a whole different mindset. If you're wanting to get into wholesale, just understand that wholesaling is a job and wholesaling is not wholesaling. The, the, you're adding two values in wholesaling. You're adding the value to the seller when you're buying from that seller and, and, and that's what you have to focus on when you're buying. You have to focus on the value and what they really need. And then on the flip side, when you're selling, your, whatever value you're adding is, is the true knowledge that you know about the property, the true knowledge you know about the rehab that's going to happen, the true knowledge about the after repaired value. I, I see way too many wholesalers out there right now that are like fluffing numbers. They have no idea about construction. They think it's a $15,000 rehab when it's a $60,000 rehab. They think, you know, the ARV is 170 or 250 when it's really like a hundred or hundred, you know, they're nowhere close on the ARV. Um, and, and I, you, you have to focus on that value. Um, so, so either way, if it, in my opinion, I also think you ought to know going into fixing and flipping, it is the riskiest part of, of real estate investing. I, 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 I don't really like to push people into fix and flipping, although I, I know a lot of people are some awesome, amazing fix and flippers in my mastermind, <coughs> but I'll tell you, I've lost more money on fix and flips than I've lost money on anything else. Every time I've lost money, it's been on a fix and flip. Um, so, um, we've made a lot of money. I, I can't say we haven't made a lot of money, but, um, you know, I, I have lost as much as 60 or 70 grand on a fix and flip. And, um, <laughs> sometimes they're avoidable. Sometimes it's our fault, but a lot of times it's just a, it's a risky business and it's not what you see on TV. So, you know, come at it from a, from a different perspective, make sure your numbers, make sure you're buying super deep and you can have many exit strategies. Um, and like I said, if you're wholesaling, I think you ought to add, talk about the value. If you're buying to hold, then it's a whole different ballgame. We can talk a different, a different talk. All right. So we have to definitely jump into a case study for sure. So you said you lost about 60000 Is there any way you can give us, you know, kind of a, you can do a deep dive into that particular deal? And, you know, what did you think you did wrong um, on that deal? And then just kind of take us on a high of a good deal that you made a ton of money or you really impacted someone's life doesn't have to be you made so much money so just give us like the tools and you know spectrum and just kind of walk us through those deals 
Well, I mean, I guess I could try that. <laughs> um, I could just tell you all the, all the things that went wrong. Um, I, I, so, so honestly, so, so, so get this, we bought a house for 60 grand and we sold it for 250. You would think there's a bunch of money to be made there, right? I lost 80 grand. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, so if, if I only show you the numbers that HGTV shows you, you would think I made a bunch of money. I mean, honestly, anybody who's looking at data from even like the big data people, Adam data and all those places that give a lot of data probably may think I made a lot of money on this deal. Um, but, but the rehab took 15 months. Um, we had contractors that took money and walked off the job. Um, we had the, the, the whole thing. I mean, so the, the, the biggest problem, and, and I'm telling you, this is constant with I, not every single time I've lost money, but almost every single time I've lost money. The biggest reason is time. So when you're fixing and flipping and you have hard money or you have any kind of money costs that you have on a property, um, I recommend that everybody create a dollar per day cost analysis on every single fix and flip that they ever do. So that dollar per day is going to include your insurance, your interest on your, your, on your loan. It's going to, it's going to include your, um, Oh, and by the way, on the exact same house, my investor made like 40 grand. Okay. So, so let that be a lesson to you as well. So the money person made 40 grand. I lost 60. Um, you know, so, you know, sometimes 50, 50 partnership is a pretty good, is a good deal. Um, is, is less, it's a lot less risky. That's another thing too. If you're a new fix and flipper getting into it, I do actually recommend you do the 50, 50 split for a while before you kind of start trying to get into uh, to uh, debt. So I actually offer equity before you offer debt when you're getting started. Um, but so I, uh, I, we hired wrong people, wrong people were managing. Um, and they're, they're, it just took forever. <laughs> and then at the very end of the project, so the very end of the project, everything was going f smoothly, you know, after we finally got a handle on this thing. And then the city decided that they're going to come in and like change half of what we needed. So that was a, that's a whole nother wild card that you, on, and honestly, it's, it's becoming more and more of a problem, especially in some of the cities that we work in. Um, and it, it's almost, it's, it's almost an epidemic. It's really bad at some points. Like you think everything's perfect and you're doing everything by the code book. And then all of a sudden they want to come in and change things. So it ends up probably costing us an extra 20 grand at the end and time. So, I mean, really, it literally, like we were ready to close and it took us like two more months to close because, you know, the city decided to, 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 to do the things that the city wants to do. So, um, I hope that answers your question. I can't really it go does. through the entire pro the whole entire project and tell you everything that went wrong, but I can just tell you time was our biggest, um, our, our biggest uh, thing that, that we, that we lost money on. And then the second thing was probably the city and that, but the reason why the, it took so long with the time is you had the wrong people managing the project. And, um, you know, so I'm actually reading a book right now. I've got my desk here. And, and I mean, I'm looking at all the things I've done wrong. You know, this is, this is actually a really good book. It's okay to be the boss. Um, and it's kind of like the step-by-step -step guide to becoming the manager that your employer, your, your employees need. And that's kind of like been my, something I've, I mean, I'm learning right now. I've always thought be the leader, show the vision, you know, and, and hire good people and they'll, and they'll all just, uh, you know, uh, they'll, you know, you, you take care of your people and they'll take care of you that, right? That's what you hear. The problem is, is like, you have to manage that every single step of the way. And I have a really large organization. I, I mean, we had as much as 39 employees. I can't manage every single project. There's just no way I'm going to do that. So I had hired people that were supposed to be managing people that were supposed to be managing people. And there was just really bad, um, you know, management of this particular project. Hmm. Okay. And then some of the ones that we made the most money on, honestly, it's, the, it's just the exact opposite. I mean, really, so there's a deal last year we made about 60 grand on, and I actually got personally involved in this particular house, and um, me and my wife actually end up staging it at the very end of the property, um, and, you know, and the, the, it's funny because even at the time, it was funny, the same people that managed the other project were telling me that I was screwing everything up with this particular project because I was getting in the middle of things and I was like, you know, kind of asking a bunch of questions and I was trying to hold people accountable to this particular project. And the whole time they're like, well, you're messing up our processes. You're messing up our system. And I'm thinking to myself, 
but this has to be done, right? Like it still has to be done, right? So what, who's going to get it done? And we made sixty thousand dollars on that pro same project last on that project last year, and um, and pretty much everything was opposite of what I just said. So it was managed. Um, the project itself took about two and a half months, and it was probably about a fifty thousand dollar rehab. And um, then the, then at the very end, we probably we took an extra two weeks on staging and getting like making the place look really really nice and um, doing some extra things maybe that you know again my some of my team members same people that were managing this other project we lost 60 grand on, um, we're upset because I was like, you know, changing things or whatever, but I'm like, it has to be done, you know? So, um, so all that to, to, I mean, really like, so the house went on the market, we sold it within two weeks, you know, and at the end of the day, like the, the lender made, you know, their two points in 10% that, that we pay the lender. And, um, you know, we end up making out pretty good. But the reason why is because, you know, the, now the other times I've lost money on other than bad management, I've lost money for buying houses we never should have bought, you know? So, um, but again, we, 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 I mean, I have bought 1600 houses, so like, you're going to make some mistakes. I'm not going to say that that's never going to happen. Um, um, that's, yeah. that's the, that's the other biggest mistake is just buying houses that you probably never should have bought. It's much better to buy only the really, really good deals than to buy a bunch of mediocre deals. Okay, cool. Before we go into the, um, the quick round, you mentioned something that I wanted us to touch on it real quick. You mentioned equity and debt in terms of having a 50-50 partnership. Can sure. you just explain to yeah. the our listeners the difference between being an equity partner or a debt partner? Absolutely. So I don't really do this at all anymore. But when I first got started, we were doing 50-50 equity splits with like, so you'd come with me, you'd come to me um, and you'd be like, hey, I got $150,000. I want to do some deals with you. What can we do? I'll be like, okay, well, you invest this $150,000. It's going to cost us $100,000 to buy this house and $50,000 rehab it. We can sell it for, you know, two twenty, dollars and we'll split all the profit. So by the end of the day, you know, like I'm not paying a daily interest on that money. So that, so the difference between that and like, so I offer you two points and 10% maybe for that same $150,000 um, every day. So the shorter time period that I can sell it, it's actually better for both of us. It really is because you're getting extra two points, which you recycle your money and you're making, you're making pretty good money. But the longer it goes, it actually only benefits the investor and really starts not benefiting you know, the, when I say the investor, I'm talking about the money person and really not the uh, boots on the ground person that actually doing the project. So debt is basically debt, which is accruing interest where equity is, there's no daily interest. You're just going to split a profit in some kind of, kind of format. Awesome. 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 So definitely, definitely joining into the quick rounds. Is that going to be quick questions and quick answers? You ready, sir? I'll try to do quick answers. I'm not so sure. I'm so good at that. <laughs> First question. What makes Tom unique? What is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next guy or the next girl? I focus on value. What was the last book that you read? And what was the one thing that you picked up from that book? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay to be the boss and that I need to be a much better manager. And really it's okay. It's okay to manage people every day. You know, the book basically says that people that accuse bosses of being micromanagers are normally low performers and the people that want accountability are normally your high performers and people that don't want accountability are normally low performers and you don't want those people on your team anyways you don't want low performers right you only want to work with a few or betters so if that's the case then by not managing by just like have be having a hands-off management um role in your business is is actually hurting it's hurting them and it's hurting you and it's going to end up hurting your company at, at some way so i and at the end of the day like i just need to be a better manager awesome um second to the last question i've got another add-on question is you've got you know good success you've got you know your companies like you like you really rightfully mentioned you've got obviously family your kids your wife you've got all these things going on what do you do for fun I love what I do. I mean, I really do. So I'm a part of a group called the Financial Friends Network. We go on cruises together. Um, I, I, it's kind of funny that people ask me this sometimes, but it's so true. Like I really do love what I do. And, I, and, and it's not because I love what I, I don't really love real estate. There's some people that really love real estate. I love people. And the problem is, is that everything you do in real estate affects people and it affects, affects my, my people that work for me. It affects my investors, you know, my, my, my money people. It affects 
um, the communities that, that we serve and that we add value to in the community. Um, it, it, it affects so much. It even affects like my investors, children. So if I'm helping my investor, like their children are going to be helped and blessed by, by me as well. So I'm so much more passionate about adding the value to the community and my community, like I said, is not just my physical neighborhood that I live in. It's every community that I'm a part of my mastermind, my employees, you, my podcast, you know, community, my mastermind community, um, you know, my church community, um, all the different communities that I, that I'm a part of, like, I want to add value to every single person that I'm a part of. Um, as far as family goes, like we do have uh, Disney timeshares. We love going to Walt Disney world. If you want fun. Um, I do have a golf membership that I try to get out to more than twice a year, like I did last year. Um, but, uh, I just really do love people and I love doing what I'm doing. All right. So this was my add on question. This is a first on the dwelling show. Be a bucket, not, um, sorry, be a conduit, not a bucket. Tell yes, sir. Tell us more about that, sir. Tell us more about that. <laughs> um, it is my mantra. Like, if you ask me what I want to be known for when I, when I die and what's on my tombstone, like, that's what I want it to be. I either wanted to say, be a conduit, not a bucket, not a bucket, or I wanted to say, work to have to give. And that, it, that whole thing is a process. Um, I'm not sure how much time you'll be spending on this, but I have a whole hour talk on be a conduit, not a bucket. So I could go for a long time. <laughs> not too really, long though. <laughs> what it really boils down to is whatever I am given. Um, and it really goes with our core values. So charity is our number one core value, which I believe is love. Number two is stewardship, which is the conduit itself. Love is what flows through the conduit. Community is the people on the outside of the conduit that you serve. And growth is either growing this conduit or making it better every time. So like, for instance, you may have a, a, a child that has special needs and you're, you have a small conduit, but you have a very pinpointed purpose in your life and whatever your purpose is in your life, that's what that you need to focus on. But on the other hand, you like, I want to be the, the, if, if, if you look at your, at your, at your, at the plumbing in your house, you know, a conduit kind of, a, you know, with all the plumbing in your house, the most prestigious fixture in your house is the tub, right? And most of us want to be the tub. The problem is, is when the tub is plugged up and, you, and you've had several people take a bath in it, right? What happens to the water? It just gets dirty and it stinks. Um, and it's just like, um, if, have, you ever, have you ever been to Israel? I actually have. Been okay. To I'm going there. I'm going to Israel uh, this December. And there are two main bodies of water over there. One is the Sea of Galilee and one is the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has a place in which it takes in water. And everything in it, though, is dead because it doesn't have a place in which it gets rid of water. The Sea of Galilee is vibrant. It's got life. It's got villages that are around it that are just like going crazy. And there's got commerce. It's got um, plant life. It's got fish life. It's got all these things going on. Why? Because it takes in water from the exact same source of water that the Dead Sea takes in water, but it also lets it go. And that's the way I feel like we should be living our life. Um, we should not be living our life for what's in it for me. My name is Jimmy. I'll take all you give me. Um, I want to live my life to have a big bucket of money at the end of my life and have the Porsche and have the Lamborghini and have the big, huge car and have all this. I want to live my life so I can have, so then I can turn around and give it to those people that are, that, that are in need. And to me, that's what I think good success is. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so, so much. I'm listening to you. I'm like, Oh my God, that's me. That's me. When I grow up, that's me. I love it. Thank you so much, Tom. I really wish we could keep going. Um, but we definitely, definitely just, you know, coming to the, to the last conclusion here. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I, I appreciate you having me on, on and uh, if there's anything I could ever do for you or anybody in your community, please let me know. Yep. And I think you can just kind of tell us, you mentioned about the book. So where can folks reach out to you, connect with you and maybe get that free book that you talked about? Absolutely. So you can actually go to, I think it's ATK book, ATK book.com. Um, and I think you can actually get the, I think you could order the book there. Um, it might be some, one of the free plus shipping or something, but it's going to probably be like five to eight bucks or something. There, you can go to Amazon and get it as well. Um, as far as to know a little bit more about me, I have no problem giving out my cell phone number as long as nobody puts me on a uh, call list that should not be called, you know, so no telemarketers, warning. 219 um, 727
I've said is my personal cell phone. I do accept text messages and I will respond. I promise. You can find me on Facebook at the Tom Olson, um, Instagram, Twitter, all those, all the handles. I'm, I'm on, I'm on social media. I would highly encourage people to listen to our podcast called the good success podcast. It's really easy to find. It's just the good success podcast. So it's pretty hard, easy. My personal email is T Olson. That's O L S O N at goodsuccess.com. And if you're interested in the mastermind, um, you can go to just goodsuccess.com, fill out the application, um, and see if you qualify for the mastermind and the community go giver event is communitygogiver.com. Awesome. And when is that? Is that in June sometime? Sure. Yeah, June 26th, 27th, and 28th. It is in our office. We can only take 80 people. So it, more than likely, seats are going to sell out. Um, we've got national speakers like Mr. Landlord and Jeffrey Taylor and um, Eddie Wilson, who owns uh, and runs Think Realty and Affinity Group and NREG. And um, there's some amazing, amazing powerhouse speakers. Quest IRA will be there. Um, Josh Belk will be there. Jeff Johnson will be there. Um, some really cool community go-givers as well, like Ken Lacey with Veterans Path Up and uh, Sonia Booker with her vault um, things. There's just so many, like, I can't even like tell you how much value is at the community go-giver event. I mean, really, I think it's like, I think the price is like four ninety nine for one and like eight ninety nine for, I mean, barely, basically it barely just covers our costs for what we're doing for the, for the week. So. Thank you so, so much, Tom. I'm just a, an honor and pleasure just to, to be with you today. Thank you so much. Awesome. If anybody also, I mean, we also have the, the Olson group as well. So if you, anybody's interested in me building a rental portfolio for them, I'd love to chat with you as well. I will hook you up with Jared who runs that company for me. But uh, if anybody's interested in me building a rental portfolio for them, I would be glad to talk to you. I'm so glad you mentioned that actually. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome.